الخير اليوم الثاني برحب فيكم باسم بيت المستقبل وبتمنى يكون اليوم الثاني مثل اليوم الاول مليء بالمعلومات وال والتحاليل يلي بتفيدكم وبتفيدنا. الجلسه الرابعه هي دور اللاعبين الاقليميين تركيا وايران والدوليين الولايات المتحده روسيا الاتحاد الاوروبي والصين في استفحال عمليه التفكك او عكسها. منسق هذه الجلسه عبيدي عبيدي صحافي وباحث من البحرين فان هذه الجلسه تهدف الى تحديد دور اللاعبين الاقليميين والدوليين في استفحال عمليه التفكك. المحاورون الينا سوبو نينا از ات جود؟ المعهد الروسي لدراسات استراتيجيه مستشاره المدير وخبيره في شؤون اسيا والشرق الاوسط. السيد حسين موسافيون سياسي باحث في جامعه برينستون في الولايات المتحده. وجوزيف بحوت باحث سائر في برنامج كارنيجي للشرق الاوسط ايضا من الولايات المتحده. اهلا وسهلا فيكم. صباح الخير جميعا. فخامه الرئيس شيخ امين جميل يشرفني ويسعدني ان اكون في هذا البيت العتيد وللامانه ربما نعرف بيت المستقبل بلقاءاته التي تعبر ان لبنان ما زالت الرئه الديمقراطيه العربيه التي نتنفس من خلالها نحن الباحثين والمفكرين ولكن فخامه الرئيس له لديه مشروع اخر لا يقل اهميه عن بيت المستقبل وهي دوريه حوليات ففي فترة مبكرة اكتشف فخامة الرئيس أن للتوثيق أهمية نفتقد حوليات الحقيقة في هذا اللقاء لأن حوليات أسست لقاعدة بيانات مهمة في تاريخ التوثيق العربي المعاصر وصلت لهذا الموضوع أفتقد في هذا اللقاء زميل هو الأخ سامي منسة الذي للأسف الشديد لنتيجة ظروف صحية لم يسعفوا الحظ كي أو لم يسعفوا الحظ كي نلتقي معه فاطلب من سيده رويده ان تبعث لتحيات المؤتمر او هذا اللقاء للاخ العزيز سام نسا. نعود الى موضوع لقائنا ولا نعرب المتحدثين فقد عرفهم الزميل ولكن بودي ان اثير مجموعه من التساؤلات تتعلق بالامن في المنطقه. السؤال الاول هل اللاعبون الاساسيون هم الدول أم الشركات يذكرني يعني اللاعبين اليوم ببداية العهد الاستعماري عندما كانت شركة الهند الغربية والشرقية أو شركة يعني ترسمان مستقبل المنطقة من الهند حتى الخليج تعود الصورة اليوم بشكل مختلف شركات عملاقة أمريكية ولن أذكر أسماء لكن آخر عشر صفقات تجارية تمت بعد شركات عملاقة في المنطقة العربية تمت بين الشركات والحكومات وليس بين الشركات والشركات بالتالي يعيد الاستعمار نفسه أو التدخل الأجنبي في المنطقة نفسه بشكل مختلف في شكل تجاري وليس في شكل عسكري أو شكل آخر السؤال الثاني الحقيقة هل حلت المعلومات للتدخل بدلا من القواعد بمعنى أنه في في فتره او الحقبه من الخامس عشر القرن الخامس عشر القرن التاسع عشر كانت الدول التي تريد ان تتدخل في شؤون المنطقه ترسل اما سفرائها واما جيوشها اليوم الشركات هي التي تبعث ولاول مره في تاريخ المنطقه تتطوع يتطوع المواطن لتزويد المتدخل باكبر كميه من المعلومات تعينه على المزيد من التدخل المعلومات تم تطوعا وليس قسرا كما كانت في السابق. اعطي مثل بسيط اذا اذا نقول ان او ادعينا ان العدو الرئيسي في المنطقه هي اسرائيل او الكيان الصهيوني اكبر قناه اتصال او من اكبر قنوات الاتصال هي فايبر هي شركه اسرائيليه ويستطيع فايبر ان ان يحول 
كل ما يمتلك التليفون اي فرق فرق يستخدم فايبر الى يعني المؤسسه او دوار صنع قرار في الكيان الصهيوني اذا اصبح التدخل طوعا وليس قسرا كما كان في السابق عندما نتحدث عن امن المنطقه حقيقه مع احترامي كل الارواق التي قدمت جرى الحديث عن الامن التقليدي ولم يتناول اي من المتحدثين الامن الرقمي ديجيتال سيكيورتي وانا اعتقد ان الان التدخل ينتقل من التدخل التقليدي او الامن التقليدي او الاختراق التقليدي الى الاختراق الامني كل شركات الاتصالات العربيه او غالبيتها لها علاقه بشركات عملاقه في الغرب ومن خلال هذه العلاقه يتم التحكم في يعني تدفق وسيل المعلومات من والى المستخدم العربي. هناك ايضا موضوع التدخل موضوع الاعلام. تاريخ الانسان يقول ان الاعلام يعكس الحدث. لاول مره في تاريخ البشريه الاعلام يصنع الحدث. بمعنى ان تستطيع يعني عبر قنوات التواصل الاجتماعي ان ان تقوم بمظاهره ليست موجوده. تقول ان هناك تجمع مليون بشر او مليون انسان في ميدان التحرير يبدا الناس يتفاوضون بناء على ان هذه المعلومه صحيحه وتصنع المظاهره بناء على يعني البث الاعلامي اللي يتحدث عن حدث غير موجود. ال انتقل من هذه الـ الـ يعني الـ الصوره الرقميه الى صوره تقليديه هل نحن نتحدث عن انحلال موضوعي ام انحلال ذاتي بمعنى هل نحن نهيئ الـ 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 الارض للتدخل اجنبي ام نحن حقيقه التدخل الاجنبي جاء قسرا ومن الخارج واعتقد انه يعني اذا استعرضنا الثلاث سنوات الأخيرة سنجد أن بلدان عربية يفترض أن تكون في نفس المنظومة السياسية هي استدعت أو استعدت طرف أجنبي ليساعدها على طرف محلي وسهل الطريق دخوله إلى المنطقة أو عودة دخول إلى المنطقة بالتالي هو أحد يعني أحدث الاختلال اللي كان مفترض أن لا يكون لفت نظري الحقيقه في جلستنا هذه ولاول مره او لاول هي الاشاره الى الصين. الصين دوله عظمى ستكون ثاني اقتصاد عالمي والاخطر من ذلك الحقيقه انه ليست للصين عداوه تاريخيه مع المنطقه وما يزيد ذلك الخطر انه التقدم التقني في الصين بدا ينافس التقدم التقني في الغرب وخاصه في القطاع الامني. شركة هواوي اليوم سبقت كل شركات الاتصالات والشركات التي تقوم بالبنية التحتية ويعني دشنت الجيل الخامس او الجي 5 قبل حتى ما تدشن في في اي منطقة غربية. والجي 5 الحقيقة اساسه امني وليس تجاري. هذه الفرشة الحقيقة المقتضبة اردت ان امهد بها للمتحدثين وانا حظيظ الحقيقه انه انا الوحيد المودريتر اللي تجلس بجانبي سيده جميله يعني فكل المودريترز كان كلهم ذكور الانثى الوحيده تجلس بجانبي فانا محظوظ ويعني انسجاما مع ذلك اعطي الكلمه للسيده الينا وسنعطيها ثلث ساعه بدل ربع ساعه كونها سيده شكرا حق ما الاولويه دائما لازم تكون للسيدات برايي خاصه وقت نكون وقت نكون بحقل الالغام هذا مثل الشرق الاوسط فشكرا جزيلا لك في البدايه اسمحوا لي ان اعلمكم كلمه روسيه فهي سباسيبا سباسيبا تعني شكرا ف <تصفيق> شكرا لحضوركم ولمازون دو فيتور ولفخامه الرئيس امين جميل وزميلنا سام منسا وفريقه سباسيبا 
وأتشرف بإعطاء الفرصة لإلقاء هذه الكلمة أمام خبراء ضالعين في قضايا الشرق الأوسط قد تجلب مرحلة المتغيرات نوعا من الغبطة لمن يتذوق أهمية تلك المراحل النادرة في تاريخ البشرية والتي ممكن تأتي بسلبياتها وإيجابياتها هذا ما جاء في روح أدبيات الشعر الروسي الشهير ألكسندر بوشكين وذاكر الشعر الآخر وهو فدر توتشيف في بعض كلماته قائلا مرحلة المتغيرات هي مائدة يدعى إليها نخبة النخبة أو ملح الأرض مثل أفضالكم ف إشكاليات منطقة الشرق الأوسط تتجاوز حدودها الجيوسياسية لتصبح مرحلة عمليات صراع القوة الدولية المتنافسة على مرحلة على معركة تحديد هيكلية توازن الأقطاب وهذا بعد فشل الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية بالتفرد في سلطة القطب الواحد هنا يتصاعد دور قوة إقليمية في نسج تكتلات سياسية دولية ومن ناحية أخرى تتكون منصات تعاون تفرضها حاجة الأمر الواقع للتوصل إلى المخارج لأزمات وتحديات المنطقة شديدة التعقيد هنا نذكر تجربة التعاون الروسي التركي الإيراني الناجحة في إنشاء مناطق خفض التصعيد في سوريا وهذا التعاون بدأ في مدينة أستنا في كازاخستان استعادت روسيا دورها اللائق في الشرق الأوسط بعد غيابها خلال مرحلة التقحقر المرافقة لانهيار الاتحاد السوفيتي السابق ويمكن تقسيم تاريخ الحضور الروسي بعد انهيار الاتحاد السوفيتي في الشرق الأوسط إلى ثلاث مراحل مفصلية الأولى هي مرحلة الغياب الشبه الكامل للدور الروسي في مسرح الأحداث الشرق أوسطية خلال فترة الغيبوبة التي قضاها الرئيس الراحل بوريس يلتسي والثانية المرحلة الثانية تبلورت تبلور فيها الموقف الحازم دون المشاركة العملية الفاعلة وما ينسجم المصطلح اعتمدته الدبلوماسية الروسية من شعر المذكور فودر توتشيف والذي عمل أيضا دبلوماسيا في القرن التاسع عشر فالمصطلح هو هكذا الحزم مع عدم المشاركة أو الحزم المتأمل بدأت هذه المرحلة برأيي بعد ثلاث سنوات من تولي بوتين الحكم في روسيا حيث ظهرت على سبيل المثال معارضة روسيا الشديدة لإجتياح العراق في سنة 2003 دون التفويض من قبل مجلس الأمن ودون قيام موسكو بأي خطوات عملية لمنع الحرب المرحلة الثالثة المستمرة منذ 30 سبتمبر العام 2015 بعد اتخاذ القيادة الروسية قرار مشاركة في مسرح العمليات الميدانية السورية لمحاربة الإرهاب الأمر الذي ساهم بإنقلاب موازين القوة في سوريا والأمر الذي أعاد فعليا السياسة الروسية لتتصدر قائمة الدول الأكثر تأثيرا على مجريات الأحداث في هذه البلاد النتائج التي حققتها روسيا سواء كانت في الميدان أو كانت في مسارات التسوية السياسية باتت محطة الاهتمام المحللين في الشرق والغرب وأستشهد لكلام الخبير الفرنسي الشهير وهو ميشيل جويا الذي قال تمكنت روسيا من إحراز هذه الإنجازات بأقل كلفة مادية وبشرية ممكنة وقد كتبها في مقاله الواسع اسمه العاصف الحمراء أو لتمبي غوج الآن روسيا تسعى للتقريب الحل السلمي في سوريا اللقاءات في أستنا والجنيف 
ممكن من الأفضل أن تستمر ولكن الأهم هو العمل اليومي للعسكريين والدبلوماسيين في سوريا نفسها وبالتنسيق مع تلك القوى الأخرى التي أيضا تسعى إلى السلام هناك من أجل تثبيت التقدم في هذا المجال ممكن أن نعقد مؤتمر سوتشي مرة أخرى ولكن يظهر سؤالا هل ممكن تحقيق السلام في سوريا في الظروف التي تؤرجح أمريكا زورقا في الشرق الأوسط بشكل أكثر فأكثر يتشكل الانطباع أن أمريكا الآن جاهزة لقلب هذا الزورق وهي متفرجة على سقوط ركابه وغرق بعضهم في النهر ممكن يكون نهر الفرات وعلى سبيل المثال هو قرار ترامب بنقل سفارة الولايات المتحدة من تل أبيب إلى القدس المثال قرار ترامب بانسحاب أمريكا من الانتفاق حول البرنامج النووي الإيراني كل هذا لديه تداعيات سلبية على الأحداث في سوريا أيضا ولكن روسيا تفهم تماما بأن التنسيق ما بين موسكو وواشنطن مطلوب وإذا كانت أمريكا تريد بالحقيقة إيجاد الحل في سوريا فروسيا مستعدة لهذا الشيء وروسيا مستعدة أن تتعاون مع أمريكا ومع الآخرين أيضا من أجل تخفيف التوتر في ملفات أخرى مثل قضية فلسطين أو قضية الملف النووي الإيراني موقف روسيا واضح جدا ومبدئي أن تبقى سوريا دولة موحدة وأن يكون هناك استقرار روسيا معنية بالمساعدة على ضبط المور في الشرق الأوسط ولكن علينا أن نجذب في هذا الزورق إلى الأمام للوصول إلى شاطئ الأمان عندما يحاول أحد آخر بعرقلة هذه الجهود ونحن حنستمر طبعا وختاما أريد أن أطلعكم على صورة من زيارتي منذ عدة أيام إلى إحدى قاعدتين روسيتين في سوريا وهي قاعدة حميمي وهذه القاعدة سأقول لكم هي لافتة في التنظيم والتجهيز ما يشير إلى عزم روسيا لاتخاذ لاتخاذها موطئ قدم لإعادة الوجود الروسي إلى مكانه الطبيعي في الشرق الأوسط ورأيت هناك لوحة مرسوم عليها دب دب بشكله كبير ولكن طيب بالوجه دب بني بني كأنه أحذروا ما هو هذا الدب فدب بروسي دب كان يوزع شيئا ما لحمامات السلام ففي البداية أنا ما فهمت شو يوزعه هذا الدب لحمامات السلام وبعد ما اقتربت من هذه اللوحة اكتشفت أنه يوزع دروعا تلبسها حمامات السلام فشكرا لكم نشكر السيدة إلينا وأخشى أن يقابل الدب يعني حمار أمريكي يقف في دولة دب بيروسي دب بيروسي أصلا ما هو الدب بيروسي وكي. طبعا ويعني أتمنى أن يعني يبحر زورق السيدة إلينا إلى بر السلام كما تحدث أنتقل من عن السيدة إلينا إلى الأستاذ مسفيان فليتفضل السلام عليكم Good morning First of all, I would like to thank you, Mr. President, and I mean Jamal, and also all organizers of this event for the invitation and making the event possible. I have been asked to talk about the challenges of security arrangement in the Middle East, the role of re uh, regional powers, specifically Iran and Turkey and the international actors. Much of West Asia today is in a state of chaos and conflict. Large part of Syria, Iraq, Yemen, and Afghanistan are devastated. 
The ongoing wars in Yemen, Libya, Syria have taken huge humanitarian tolls. Political solution to the current crisis are still uncertain. Even though there is no military solution for any conflict. Many terrorist groups are still active throughout the region and pose a major threat to all regional and global powers. <clears throat> Instability in the Middle East continues to decisively impact international and regional peace and security. The region is in the midst of two interconnected conflicts. One between regional powers and the other between global powers. Moscow's intervention in Syria, together with Iran, if with Iranian support, has changed the balance of power in the conflict. Meanwhile, disputes between regional powers have reached to an unprecedented level of hostility, as seen in Saudi, Emirati, and Israeli rhetorics, actions, and alliance against Iran. The roots of instability and conflict in the Middle East today goes back decades. There have been three major sources contributing to regional instability. The first is the full and unconditional support the United States and the other world powers have provided corrupt dictators such as the Shah of Iran or Hosni Mubarak of Egypt and numerous other dictators in the Arab and Muslim world. These dictators have presided over condition of poverty, unemployment, bad governance, and political suffocation, which all contributes to extremism and terrorism. The second root cause is because Washington has given carte blanche support to Israel, as it has concurred occupied and annexed Arab land in violation of international law. The third cause of regional instability are the wars that have engulfed the region. In this regard, the first mistake of the United States, its Arab allies and other major global powers was supporting Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein during Iraq's invasion of Iran, including the use of chemical weapons which killed and injured, injured tens of thousands of Iranians. Their support of attacking Iran backfired with Saddam's invasion of Kuwait. The second major mistake of the US and its allies were the post-September 11 invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq, which unleashed chaos and violence in large part of the region. The U.S. invasion of Iraq led to the rise of ISIS and other brutal terrorist groups that United Nations has said are the top threat to global security. In Afghanistan, after 17 years of U.S. occupation, the Taliban remains in, co in control of vast part of the country. The third major mistake of the U.S. and its allies were their military attack on Libya. The NATO regime change military operation in Libya has resulted in a failed state in the Arab and Muslim world. The fourth bad mistake, as former Qatar Prime Minister Athani said, was about Syria. He said that the US and the regional allies made mistakes in supporting extremist groups in Syria. Former Vice President of the United States, Joe Biden, also publicly stated that the U.S. regional allies were a problem in support in Syria, supporting the extremist and terrorist groups. In Syria, the CIA, in cooperation with the regional allies, U.S. regional allies, led efforts to topple the Syrian government. This operation led to the death of over 100,000 troops, Syrian troops. According to the Washington Post's David Ignatius report, the Syrian civil war also marked a new phenomenon in the Middle East's modern history. Previously, governments in the region had been changed in three ways. 
The first popular revolutions like Iran, Revolution 1979, or Egypt in 2011. The second foreign instigated coup d'etat, such as US-UK coup in Iran 1953 against Mohammad Mossadegh. The third regime change through direct foreign military intervention, such as Afghanistan, military in intervention in Afghanistan, Iraq, or Libya. However, in Syria, there was a new phenomenon of over 100,000 foreign terrorists from all over the world were organized and exported to the country to bring regime change. This is a new phenomenon in the history of Middle East. The fifth disastrous mistake is the US, UAE, US, uh, Saudi war on Yemen. The Saudi war on Yemen has been described by the United Nations as the worst world humanitarian crisis. With tens of thousands killed or wounded, millions displaced, and the outbreak of famine and gloria. In such a devastated region, amongst other regional powers, Iran and Turkey are two key players which can play a major role on crisis management in the Middle East. The, region, the, the relation suffered from 2011 on Syrian crisis since Turkey was after regime change by supporting extremists and terrorist groups and Iran was supporting the central government. Nevertheless, Turkey has also evolved in recent years from being a, a loyal U.S. NATO ally to a more independent regional power. This has recently, this has been recently the case in Syria where, when Turkey has joined Russia and Iran in Astana process peace talk which have made practical progress in negotiating ceasefire and negotiation between rebel forces and the Syrian government. Since it entered the Astana talks, Turkey has taken major steps to stop the movement of arms, peoples, and money that crossed its borders in support of terrorist groups, groups in Syria. About Turkish-Iranian relation, it's important to note that in the past 400 years, since Safavid Ottoman era, Iran and Turkey have not gone to a war and there has been always peace and cooperation between two big countries. The reality is that there cannot be a peace in the region unless there is a cooperation between all major regional and global powers. The relationship, the relations simply cannot be zero sum. No side benefits from opposing mutually beneficial cooperation. And there cannot be a peace if major and regional powers oppose it. The major regional divide today includes division between Arabs and non-Arab states. Turkey and Iran are the two major non-Arab states. They each have their own sets of problems and security concerns in the Arab world as well as with the West. Turkey has opposed the crackdown of groups such as the Muslim Brotherhood in many Arab countries, such as Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Emirates. Iran feels threatened by export of Wahhabism, an ideology that explicitly views Shia Muslims as heretics, and with which many terrorist groups also follow the same ideology. Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman has, of course, publicly stated that Turkey and Iran are together part of triangle of evil, along with Muslim Brotherhood. Turkey and Iran can establish a stabilizing regional equilibrium on balancing the role of global powers in the region in favor of global peace and security. Another major regional divide is between Arabs themselves. During the last three decades, at least four Arab countries, Kuwait, Libya, Yemen, Syria, 
have been attacked by other Arab states. Even Qatar, as member of GCC, is now sanctioned and threatened by Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Bahrain. Overall, the central issue in the Middle East today is the lack of regional cooperation system coupled with foreign intervention. Durable regional peace requires institutionalized cooperation and dialogue between all major regional and global powers. The regional powers are mainly Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Iraq, and Iran. Three major diplomatic innovations are necessary to alleviate regional crisis and foster long-lasting regional cooperation, peace, and stability. They all entail institutionalized regional security cooperation system between regional powers. The first would be the expansion of Economic Cooperation Organization, ECO, the organization founded by Iran, Turkey, and Pakistan in 1985, which now focus on economic cooperation, but this should be expanded to political, security, cultural, and military cooperation. The ECO today includes 10 countries in Eurasia, which uh, with about 470 million inhabitants. The union can be strengthened and modeled after the EU. With deeper political, economic, security ties between its member states would be a formidable block that could provide security and its member states uh, for its member states, stabilize the region and project influence in Central Asia and Caucasus. The second would be establishing a regional cooperation and security system in the Persian Gulf. The feuds between the Persian Gulf countries, whether Arab-Arab disputes, like between Saudi Arabia and Qatar, or Iraq or some GCC countries, or the tensions between Iran and Arabs, specifically Iran and Saudi Arabia, can be addressed through establishing a regional cooperation security system, which would include economic, political, cultural security, and military cooperation. These states have two options, <clears throat> cooperation, or continuing the status quo of confrontation. If they choose continue to continue the confrontation, regional instability will increase. Terrorist groups will be empowered. <clears throat> Sectarianism will increase. And there will be a real risk of disastrous war that will not only engulf regional powers, but possibly the global powers, specifically the US and Russia. The other option for the Persian Gulf countries are to pursue avenues of cooperation. To do this, the foreign ministers of six GCC states, Iran and Iraq, must at the first, openly and without any precondition, enter a direct dialogue and put all of their security concerns on the table. The third would be a forum for Arab and non-Arab dialogues. Other regional powers such as Egypt should play a role to reduce the threat of sectarianism. Shia Sunni dialogue forum should be set up that see the participation of Sunni scholars from Al-Azhar, Cairo, religious leaders from Saudi Arabia and other Sunni countries, as well as Shia clerics and Marja'at Aqlids from Qom and Najaf seminaries. Any sustainable partnership between regional powers must be based on the principles of respect for sovereignty, non-use of force, respect for borders and territorial integrity, peaceful settlement of disputes, and non-interference in internal affairs of other countries. A gradual process could begin with uh, representatives from these states, 
ranging from diplomats to technocrats, civil society leaders, artists, and academics to meet regularly. Over time, or at the same time, in parallel, high-level negotiations that allows the countries to understand each other's security grievances can lead to a formal, institutionalized, cooperative relationship similar to Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSCE, and other similar systems elsewhere in the world. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moussaian. Uh, thank you for this comprehensive panoramic uh, view on the Middle East. But I'm afraid I have to disagree with you. And this is not the topic of this uh, forum. I mean, you mentioned the Persian Gulf, and this is a debatable. This is a, de a debatable, uh, I mean, let's say, terminology for the Gulf, whether it's Persian or Arab. Uh, and this is not the theme of this forum, but I have to mention this because you mentioned the Persian Gulf. Second, from your, I mean, panoramic views, you almost accused the Arabs for this, the problems and made Iran very innocent political player. Uh, uh, sorry? Uh, 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 there is, a, I mean, a, a very solid intervention of the Iranian uh, in, internal affairs of the, let's say, Arabian Gulf states. In 1970, uh, Shah Iran sent its troops to intervene in the internal conflict between uh, a popular uprising against the regime, and there was 600 Iranian soldiers. Uh, definitely, there was a qualitative shift after the Khomeini revolution, but still there are three islands, Arab islands, recognized by the international laws, occupied by Iranian troops, and I mean, there are a lot of appeals to to move from this island, and still uh, the Iranians insisted to occupy these islands. Third, but I mean, last but not least, uh, if you read Ahmed Shalabi's book about the intervention of Iran in Iraq, and I don't speak on behalf of Iraq because Dr. Dabak is here, uh, but there was direct involvement without any request from the Iraqi uh, people for the Iranian to interfere, yet Iranians were there in, in Iraq. And I leave the other stories in other Arab countries to be talked about, I mean, whoever would like to take the floor. But definitely, Iran is not innocent, as you put it. Thank you very much. And I will move now to Mr. Bahoud, and please take the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, Mr. President Amin Jmail, uh, thank you very much for this invitation, and thank you for uh, Maison du Futur to have me here. It's always a pleasure to be back in, uh, in my country and to see some, uh, I mean, various friends who are very dear here. Um, in fact, in this session, I have a, a, a quite odd uh, role uh, because, in fact, I'm, I'm sandwiched between uh, two regional and global powers, which are <laughs> Iran and Syria, and uh, they both... Uh, yeah, but I'm, 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 I'm a Lebanese French citizen living in the United States. And, um, but no, mainly, I mean, uh, what, what I mean to say is that it was difficult for me to try to... Um, to craft uh, a, an intervention that would uh, shed a light on the state of global affairs today, because this is, the, this is the title of this panel in particular, and trying to pick up a few points from here and there and maybe add, add to them. In fact, what I would like to say um, briefly, and this will be the conclusion of my presentation, is that uh, by putting the many bullet, bullet points that I will present very quickly, uh, I will try to draw a, a grim, unfortunately, and you will, you will uh, excuse me for that, a grim picture of the, the trends for the region and probably maybe for uh, the global scene in, in the years and, and the decades to come. And to show, and this is the title of this, of this conference for the two days, uh, to show that in fact the, the trends and the processes towards, or the dynamics towards unraveling, dissolution, fragmentation, and etc are almost everywhere we pick up. And in fact, having all this in flux, all these points in flux at the same time, render it very difficult, in fact, for any power or international organization today to try to frame things 
in a more uh, disciplined or more optimistic, uh, optimistic uh, outcome. So uh, I, would, I would try to put these points very quickly and I would, I would divide them in three on, or, or, or talk about three levels or two levels and one more specifically about what's happening in the US today in regards uh, to Iran. Uh, the state level, what's happening, the, the many unravelings on the state level, the unravelings on the non-state level, we called, that, we called it yesterday the non-state actors, I would prefer to call it the non-state level, and then a few words on uh, US and Iran. Um, on, the, on the global level, on the global state level, the first uh, acknowledgement that we have to make, and I think several points that were made both by you, Elena, and by you and by others yesterday, show us that uh, despite or underneath the appearance of a kind of global cooperation between the US and Russia, we are, and this is at least my view, uh, we are really at the verge, if not already started to be, in a, a new kind of Cold War. We're, we're in a new kind of Cold War. Of course, it's not the Cold War that we knew, and there's a lot of debate in in the American or in the political science literature about this is not a Cold War because the Cold War was between two ideological visions and etc. This is only a geopolitical rivalry. The imbalance between the two powers is enormous, so we don't have a real Cold War, etc. I beg to differ with that for many, for many reasons. Of course, we're not yet in a full Cold War, but there are shades of competition between the two global powers that in fact at least if are not conducing to a kind of polarization of the world system, but at least to the impeding of uh, proper resolutions, and Syria, Iran, maybe tomorrow, is a case uh, in point. Now, on uh, the micro level, the specific level, we have seen already a lot of uh, pinpoints that are preparing the scene for a, glo a more global or a gro or growing confrontation between the two, the two superpowers. The Skripal affair, for example, is a typical Cold War incident. The Wagner incident that happened in Syria uh, a few months ago, i.e. the fact that American forces uh, kill more than 2,070 uh, Russian operators on the ground. They are not soldiers, but they are operators, and we know the links between uh, the Wagner Corporation and, and the Kremlin. Uh, I think you won't disagree with that, uh, Elena. Uh, and lately, for example, yesterday, the acknowledgement that the uh, Malaysian uh, aircraft, the MH73, the MH was shot down by a, a Russian missile, the unit uh, 53 of the Russian army, and etc. Without entering into, into these small details, we have a climate of rivalry between uh, the, two, the two big powers. But why I say that maybe we are at the verge of a Cold War? Because we tend to maybe minimize too much the ideological or at least the cultural aspect of this rivalry between the two uh, superpowers. Today, Russia and Elena, I'm very happy that you uh, made these uh, this, this depiction of three steps of the coming back of Russia on the world scene. If we don't understand, in fact, that through Syria and probably the Levant in general and maybe the Middle East in global, uh, the Russian aim is, in fact, uh, to use these crises. And I think that Syria for Russia was really an opportunity crisis. It was not a crisis per se. Is to come back to a parity on the global scene by uh, matching the, let's say, the, the imbalance of power in real terms, armament, wealth, etc., by using the crises to, in fact, put again Russia on the world scene as at parity with the U.S. And the fact of using five times in three years a veto at the, National Sec uh, at the U.N. Security Council is something that is notable on that level. The, the other shade or the other uh, uh, reason why I'm saying that there is a kind of Cold War is that in fact for Russia and for the West today, there is a growing confrontation between uh, two sets of norms and values. The West is still, at least until today, very imperfectly and with a lot of weaknesses, still holding to a set of values and norms, which is liberal democracy, free trade, uh, open society and etc. While Russia is openly advocating, and this is not an accusation, I mean, this is what Russia stands for, which is a kind of 
at least a liberal democracy if it's not a, a kind of authority, authoritarian shape of power that it's assumed. Uh, the, the, the idea of a strong man and etc. The idea of the importance of religion in society, a liberal uh, society in terms of social norms and etc. Things having to do with uh, human values and etc. And I think that these trends augur towards or augur to uh, a kind of confrontation between uh, two, I, don't, I won't say ever civilizations, but at least two sets of norms that are in fact more and more increasingly uh, putting the roots of a confrontation between uh, the two global powers on the world scene. The second level of uh, dissolution or unraveling or uh, fragmentation on the global level, on the global state level, is the one that you mentioned, which is uh, the, the inter-Arab. I'm focusing on the Middle East, of course. Uh, is the inter-Arab uh, dissolution. Of course, we all know the situation, but I think that also this is not an epiphenomenon. I mean, the rift between uh, Qatar on one side, uh, Saudi Arabia, the uh, Arab Emirates, and etc. on the other side, the Arab Cold War that was played on the soil of Syria and is still played on the soil of Syria, the, cold, the Arab Cold War that is extremely vivid in Yemen and in Libya. Libya is today maybe 60% of Yemen could be read as a struggle between Qatar and the Emirates, I mean, by proxies. Eastern uh, Libya and Western Libya are, in fact, both supported by Arab countries that are uh, in conflict. And this conflict is not only a kind of a conflict of jealousies between two dynasties and etc. I think it is much more profound than that. It touches first the issue of Iran, which is in fact the spectrum or the, the hollow spectrum that is wave, hovering over the Arab world today. Who is close to Iran, who is not close to Iran? The second issue, which is very important, has to do with the relation to political Islam. Uh, the question of the brotherhood, of course, is, is the forefront. How, but more than that, the issue of political Islam between uh, these two uh, Arab camps, let us say. And third, uh, which is related to the issue of political Islam, the question of revolution change versus status quo uh, uh, unchangeability and etc. Today I think it's, uh, it's obvious to everyone that uh, the couple, which is Saudi Arabia, uh, the UAE, is today leading the camp of counter-revolution in, uh, in the Arab world. You can see it in Egypt, you can see it in Libya, you can see it maybe in some uh, places uh, in Syria and etc. against other powers that don't have the same, let us say, uh, um, hesitation towards uh, embracing uh, issues of change and uh, uh, probably include the inclusiveness of the political spectrum to other forces that are that were still until today unacceptable in, in, in the Arab political life. The third um, issue which I, I will mention quickly because I'll come back to it at the end is um, because of that, probably, and this is where I have a, a hypothesis that I would like to, to test here, I think that uh, the ability, having said that we are at the verge of a Cold War, the ability of the two global powers, and this is probably the stark difference with the Cold War, there is a strong inability by the global powers today to impose solutions for regional crisis. I mean, I often hear that, uh, very simplistically, that it suffices that the Americans and the Russians uh, get to an agreement on Syria for this crisis to stop. I, I think that this is completely wrong. I think that today the ability of regional powers to at least torpedo a solution, if not to impose a solution, is much bigger than the ability of foreign, of the big powers to impose a solution. If today there is an agreement between the US and Russia on Syria, and Iran, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and others are not in agreement, I think that the crisis will not stop and will probably take uh, shapes that are more uh, malevolent than the shapes that we have witnessed so far. So we have now this new triangle also, which is Turkey, Russia, uh, Iran in the Middle East, that is in fact, uh, by coincidence, three non-Arab states that are encompassing the Arab region. And we see this kind of trio at play in Syria, it's embodied in the Astana Sochi uh, couple of conferences. But here again also, this is not a stabilizing framework. It is a stabilizing framework on the micro level. The Astana process can produce destabilization zones. It can produce ceasefires. It can produce uh, truces or lulls for a period. However, and the Sochi conference has shown that it is unable to produce a political solution, not only because there is no international sanctioning of that or benediction for that, but because the trio itself is in flux, is in flux within 
I mean, the countries that compose it. There is, uh, albeit what you say, a rivalry between Iran and Turkey, not only a Sunni Shia rivalry, but a geopolitical and other rivalry. There is a rivalry between Turkey and Russia that has been put under the shelf now because there has been a kind of, uh, let's say, show of force that turned sour between the two countries. And there is, and we talked about it yesterday, I think a potential rivalry, if not a conflict, and not at all because it's impossible in the, in the prevalent condition, a kind of uh, friction or competition between Russia and Iran uh, to be seen in Syria in the immediate and very probably in other places in the Middle East in the coming years, although it will stay uh, under, under certain, let's say, constraints. And I will, I will say a few words about that at uh, the end. So uh, the, third, the fourth level of state unraveling or state flux, and this I will only mention it because it will be my conclusion, my conclusion is this new phenomenon that we are not perceiving enough we are not taking its consequences enough in, into account, which is this very um, notable convergence today between, uh, let's say, the Israeli security software in the region, a kind of Arab slash Gulfi uh, vision, the, the Saudi Emirati vision towards Iran, and the convergence of all this on the international level with what is happening today in Washington. I mean, the Trumpist let's say, a trend, which is not only a Trumpist trend. I, I, I think that if Trump falls tomorrow because of uh, a judicial issue or et cetera, this trend is today now well in place in the U.S., at least because we have this pendulum swing game in the U.S., in Washington, that after Obama, a strong retrenchment and a strong, let's say, uh, policy of openness towards Iran and etc. We have to go back to something much, uh, much more, much more uh, harsh and much more uh, radical. So you have this convergence that will have a lot of consequences on the region, and this will be uh, my conclusion if, if you give me a little bit of time. Now, on the second level, the non-state uh, set of unraveling dynamics. It's also at place. Some of it has started a few years ago, some of it had started a few decades ago, but we haven't seen it. And some of it is just starting and I think is candidate for, uh, for, for being there for a while. The first one, of course, and the most vivid that we know and we talk about it, and unfortunately Lebanon is completely on that fault line, and probably it was the precursor in that fault line, which is the Shia-Sunni friction, tension, conflict, competition, call it as you wish, I, I really don't, I mean, I don't want to enter now in the, in the denomination uh, issue. But this Sunni-Shia tension has started, to my mind, well before it started officially after the fall of Saddam Hussein in Iraq. It started with the Ta'if agreement, which in fact tried to organize the Sunni-Shia competition uh, in Lebanon. I think the trend after 2003, the fall of Saddam Hussein, the unraveling <coughs> of Iraq, completely unleash these dynamics on the regional level. Uh, I think, uh, without entering here in a Lebanese polemics, the assassination of uh, Prime Minister Rafiq Hariri in 2005 was a crucial uh, stepping stone into that conflict. I think it completely opened the doors in Lebanon for that conflict to express itself, and unfortunately, we are still living in it. And with the Arab revolutions, and mainly Syria in 2011, the fact that Iran entered the Syrian, uh, let's say, quagmire, the Gulf states entered the Syrian quagmires, gave also the Sunni-Shia conflict a scene of projection uh, in Syria. The second level of unraveling, and we, call, we talked about it a lot yesterday when we talked about the non-state actors. The, the, the transnational, call them non-state actors, that are both sub-etatic or sub-static and suprastatic, mm -hmm. i.e above the states and beyond the states, are still at play. You have the global jihadi networks, and I mean, the bad news, I'm sorry to say, is that if you think that ISIS is over, you're ahead for a big, for a lot of surprises. Of course, ISIS is, is dead in the form that we know it, but ISIS is still uh, a, a, a about to morph and able to morph and probably will morph under new forms and probably entrench in new theaters in the region. You have, of course, the trend of militias like the uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps that is today a transnational trend. Uh, yesterday, someone called it a, a Légion étrangère. I, I hate this, this metaphor because as a French, I know that uh, Légion étrangère is something completely different, but it is a, it is a foreign legion of 
of combatants that is today able to roam around the entire Middle East. I need five minutes, just if you, if you allow me. To roam around from Yemen to Bahrain to Iraq, maybe tomorrow to other countries in, in the Maghreb and etc., and to play uh, this role, fueling, uh, fueling of course, uh, the dynamics of unraveling and fueling also the Sunni Shia, uh, the Sunni Shia uh, tension. The third level on that non state uh, unraveling uh, level is something that we tend to forget because we are focused on the immediate, is also the rise of forces that are both sub-etatic and supra-etatic. And here I mentioned the Kurds. I mean, the Kurds are a factor that is, of course, a, a force of unraveling within each and every nation state in the Middle East, at least four of them. But at the same time, it's an irredentist trend that has, of course, the ambition of uniting at some point. Maybe it, will, it won't happen before 100 years, but this dynamic is already at play and it is also fueling the trends of unraveling. I will end up uh, very quickly, if you allow me, Mr. Chairman, on a few thoughts about uh, what all this can lead to if we put it in the cauldron that is now the crisis of the post-American withdrawal from the Iran deal. We haven't mentioned it yesterday, which is amazing, because this is the thing that is today the first point on our radar. A few quick thoughts about that. The first one is about the Trump's rationale, the American rationale. First of all, we have to keep in mind that this is the Iran, the anti-Iran thing in the U.S., let's call it this way, is, and, and I, I think you have to really put it in your minds in order to avoid surprises, is a common denominator uh, in the U.S. between or among a lot of wings of the political establishment both Democratic and Republican, and mainly within the Republican Party. Being anti-Iran today in the U.S. is an easy, it's an easy uh, dish, it's an easy meal to have. So it's a way of reuniting, for Donald Trump at least, the many wings of the Republican world that he was one of the dividers. He was one of the dividers of that scene, and the anti-Iran thing is a way to reunite that thing. The second, I mean, on the Trump rationale, I think that if you read superficially the statements of Donald Trump himself when, we with, when he withdrew from the GCPOA and then the Pompeo 12 points, you can read it as an attempt to renegotiate a better deal under tremendous pressure on Iran. This is the bright side of the, of the story. But I think that if you read it thoroughly and you decode or you decipher what is behind the words and even sometimes said, there is the open will and the open ambition of, in fact, reaching a point where you fall down the Iranian regime. And there is a regime change ambition uh, behind that, which leads me to the second point very quickly. The other thing that is also adding to the unraveling in the, in the region is that the withdrawal from the GCPOA, plus other things, I, don't, I won't get into war trades and etc., is today causing a tremendous rift and divorce between the transatlantic couple, in the transatlantic couple and within, between Europe on the one side and the US on the other side. You can't imagine the harshness with which the American administration talks about, for example, France, Great Britain, and, and, and Germany, if they dare to disagree with any of the points on the Iran strategy. The, the threats that are put forward by people at the NSC and people that we can see in the administration against Europe, even <laughs> threatening a war trade, a, a trade war on that level, is something <laughs> unprecedented in the relation, probably stronger than in 2003 where ne there was a disagreement about the war on Iraq. And this will impede also dynamics of uh, uh, convergence and reconciliation and peace building in the region. Which leads me to the last point. The last point, and I'll end on that. I think that uh, having said all that, probably, I don't know if it's uh, thought or not, if it's uh, conscious or not in the heads of the American uh, planners and in the head of Trump, you will have two consequences for that. First of all, if there was any chance to kind of put a wedge between Iran and Russia in Syria and the Middle East, this kind of Iranian dynamics will re approach, in fact, Iran and Russia and will re-coalesce them. The second thing, it's probably it will open a much greater leeway for countries like China to take a, bit, a greater role in the Middle East. Today, probably, Iran has only two windows, in 
fact to escape the sanctions because the Europeans will budge to the American uh, blackmail. The only window is China, India, and etc. And this will give a greater role to China. I don't know if uh, Henry Kissinger, who sees a lot Donald Trump, told him that this is a way to replay the 70s game, but I think it's not a very clever idea. And the last point, and I come back to this convergence between uh, the Trump administration, the Israeli security paradigm, and the Gulf paranoid paradigm against Iran, I think that we are heading, having said all this, towards a kind of unavoidable today, maybe something will change it tomorrow, unavoidable collision course between at least Israel and Iran, the question is, when will it take place openly? How will it take, it take place openly? And where will it take place openly? In the south of Syria, in the south of Syria and the south of Lebanon, in the entirety of Lebanon and Syria, or maybe, God uh, forbids, in the entire region against Iran itself and with repercussions on the Gulf. So having said all this, what I mean to say, what I am, I'm, 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 I mean, I'm very sorry to say that, I think I have fueled, and this presentation fuels uh, a kind of pessimistic view that, in fact, in this landscape, you barely find one point that could lead to something, uh, let's say, that could help us avoiding uh, the collision course that is unfortunately inscribed today in the market. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bahmoud, for this very pessimistic, uh, I mean, uh, interpretation for the future of the Middle East. You made me happy when you said, like me, but then you came back to your optimism, uh, pessimism and talked that there is no real solution that we should expect from all, uh, let's say, projects coming in the Middle East. Okay, I see many hands. So... Thank you. Uh, we start this But make it this short, so I have a lot of hands. Yes, well, there, there are a few, few points. Uh, uh, I mean, this is a very interesting panel. A great uh, uh, great uh, thoughts and ideas. But maybe my comments to uh, Sayyid Hussein uh, is, is that uh, I think I agree with his conclusions, that there has to be cooperation and dialogue. That's very important, I believe. There are all kinds of attempts to bring the entire GCC into a line that uh, is uh, pushed through the Trump administration, and we should not fall into that. Uh, so there I agree with you. Um, I agree that the zero sum is not going to work, that we will only keep bleeding each other till the end. Uh, but I also have problems with your reading of the Syrian revolution and the facts. I urge you to look deeper into the Syrian situation. I know you know, you must know, that it started as a regular Syrian rebellion throughout, and it took quite a while before any armed men from the Syrian revolution appeared on the scene. It was the brutality of the Assad regime that created all of that havoc. It involved the Iranians, but it also involved later on the Russians. And, and so you, you are in a, in a situation where you are also stuck, you've eaten much more than you must, or you can, or you should, and, and it's a quagmire. Uh, I think there is a misreading of the Arab Spring, there is a misreading of the Arab Rebellion, there is a misreading of what the Arab youth want, there is a misreading of what the Syrian youth wanted, which built so many things. Even when you saw that all these armed men came and all the, yes, but it was built on a situation. And the Assad regime wanted the extremists to appear on the scene by releasing many from jail. So, so, uh, so I, I, I agree on the conclusion. We need to cooperate, we need to talk, we need to talk Thank that you. Trump, uh, 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 all this pushing the region in a certain direction. And I think there is a miscalculation as well in Iraq. You took more and there is a backlash in Iraq. So um, I urge you maybe to relook and reread, but I agree with your conclusions. And I think there is always space for dialogue, and we should seek that. And if you want to comment to, on that, uh, thank, I you, Gabbard, I thank, thank you, Mr. Gabbard. Thank you very much. Too. But uh, please, everybody speaks, just mention his name or her name. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, Madame Suponina and Said Hossein for their presentations. Um, 
I think very little was said about the respective real objectives of both countries and using the image that uh, Mr. Sukunina has brought up, uh, according to my understanding, neither the bear nor the lion are by definition very friendly animals. They tend to be ferocious and have sharp teeth and they are very hungry. Um, but I would like to look at the issue from one uh, specific angle and ask a question to, uh, to Seth Hossein. Uh, there is, to say the least, very tangible discomfort in this region, in Lebanon and in other Arab countries, about the role of, um, of Iran. It is clear that Iran, and I have to, to go back uh, to Mr. Wadley and say, of course, nobody is innocent in this crisis. You've said these two countries are not innocent, but I don't think anybody in the Syrian crisis has been innocent, and that has, been, has to be said as well that Iran sees an opportunity for a number of reasons to involve itself in Syria. And uh, probably some of these reasons are, from an Iranian perspective, maybe even understandable. But my question is whether this involvement has not come at an extremely high cost, especially at the following level. There is discomfort in the region, and Iran as such is very unpopular in this region. And I think that is true for Syria as well. Uh, Syrians are very, very worried of Iran and the Iranian role there. Quite the contrary with Russia. I think uh, when it comes to Russia, Syrians have much more trust in the role of, uh, of, of, of Russia. They also have to do with the old and long-standing tradition of relations between Syria and, and, and Russia. But on top of this, it is my understanding that even within Iran, the regional role of Iran is, in the best case, completely un uninteresting for people, and in the worst case, is extremely unpopular. Iranians themselves are not interested in this involvement, and they don't, um, they don't, they don't even, even wish for this. And if we take as a consequence of this involvement the American withdrawal from the agreement, and of course it is not about the agreement, it is about Iran's regional role, and we start to see the costs on the economic level, with the sanctions being reinstated and the Europeans maybe maybe not being able to compensate for any losses. And that in a situation where the Iranians desire prosperity and space to breathe, not just politically, but especially economically, and to fulfill the enormous potential that this country has, combined with the unpopularity of the Iranian role in the region, I wonder how dangerous this is for Iran itself and whether from that perspective alone Iran has made some bad choices since the signing of the agreement, whether the focus should have been somewhere else, rather than take this, the agreement as a carte blanche for further interventionism in the region. I'd very much like to hear your views on that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bell. Yes. But, uh, just the name, please. Thank you for the comprehensive statements. It's very important. Russell Berman, thank you all for those comprehensive statements. Uh, I learned a lot. I appreciate your positions. Uh, so very briefly, uh, to um, Mr. Uh, Musavian, you expressed your admiration for the role that Turkey has played in the past few years in the region. And I agree with you that all powers in the region should play a role. Do you have anything at all to say about what's taken place in Turkey internally in the past few years? Uh, and to, uh, to uh, Ms. Subonina, um, I'd like to give you a chance to, an invitation to respond to uh, Mr. Bahu's brief comment on the finding about the dining, downing of the Malaysian airline. Do um, you have thoughts on that finding? Thank you. I'll give the floor to the speakers and then we'll have another round. Yeah. Syrian prices. The fact is we have really differences to read different crises in the region. We have differences how to read Syria. We have differences how to read Bahrain crisis. We have differences how to read Yemen. We have differences how to read uh, Libya. We have different uh, uh, reading on every regional crisis. But in Syria, if you respect, there is a legal government in Syria, recognized by United Nations, whether we like it or not, whether it is dictator or not. We have too many dictators in the region. Yes, you are one of them. 
<laughs> if the government has invited Russia and Iran to fight terrorism, if I asked a while ago from a Saudi friend why your troops are in Bahrain, why you are fighting the majority Shia population in Bahrain, why you are not helping a compromise there. He said, we are invited by the legal government of Bahrain, although it's minority, to send our troops there. I said, fine. And Syria has also a legal government, has invited Russia and Iran to fight terrorists. But the others are not invited. The presence of other countries are illegal based on international rules and regulations. What I said in my lecture, I said the Syrian crisis in, in, is a new phenomena because we have never had in the past over 100,000 terrorists from United States, Europe, Chechnya, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, everywhere to be organized, financed, weaponized to go to a country to bring a regime change. I just said this phenomena is new, we have never had such a method of regime change. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. However, my main point here today was avoiding the blame game. By blame game, we are not going to reach to anywhere. I had three proposals as constructive proposal for peace, security in the region. One was a regional cooperation between Iraq, GCC and Iran, comprehensive one like EU. We all remember the disputes after the Second World War between Germany, Europe, Germany, UK, France, the three powers, which really uh, ended to two big world war, uh, wars. Yes, in GCC also we have Iran, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and the small countries, they are worried not only about Saudi Arabia, Iran, they are worried about the hegemony of Saudi Arabia, to be very frank. After Iran, they are worried about Saudi Arabia. And if uh, Saudi Arabia is resolved, they later they would be worried about Iraq because you remember Iraq invaded Kuwait. Therefore, we need a regional cooperation. This was idea one. The second was a, a, a forum for dialogue between Arab and non-Arabs in the region. And the third, because Pakistan, you know, the home of Taliban, the home of extremism, you know Turkey, the role of Turkey, the role of Iran, and I proposed ECO, which is economic cooperation, to be like EU cooperation. Over there we have 470 million. In Persian Gulf we have about 170 million. My idea was a regional cooperation system in order to avoid global powers, rivalries in the region, and the, the rivalries between, between the, the, the regional powers about the role of Iran. As long as you do not understand the Iranian concerns of threat, you would not be able to understand why Iran has such a regional behavior. Just some months after revolution, before Hezbollah, before Syria, before Assad, before all these new accusations, there was nothing. An Arab country invaded Iran. GCC sent $110 billion to bring disintegration in Iran, not regime change. Over a million Iranians, they were killed or injured. They used weapons of mass destruction. The US, Europe provided material and technology against Iranian nation, over 100,000 Iranians. You see what happening, what's happening if 40, 50 people are killed in, in, in Syria for chemical weapons, which is okay. But you remember nobody talked about 100,000 Iranians killed or injured when the world power and Arab power used chemical weapons against Iranians. Today, around Iranian borders, the US military is there, terrorism instability is there, all of the borders. Persian Gulf is the U.S. It is not GCC. The U.S. is there. You read, uh, many times you heard President Trump told the GCC uh, heads 
if you are not supporting you, you will not be able to stay in power for two weeks. Therefore, Iranians military invasion on Iran. I'm chairing the session. So I do, I do, I'm a minority, but I have to respect my chairmanship. I think let's focus on the theme of the session. I know there are a lot of irritating, and I don't want this to have a, a kind of a one-to-one. -one. Please let us, how do we see the rivalries of the international power in the region? Otherwise, this will have no, I mean, it will defeat the objective of all this meeting if we continue just like this. So I have to stop you, and I'll go to Helen. Oh, sorry. Ladies first. Russell, uh, on the question, uh, Joseph said that he spoke to the people who were ليس من أجل أن نتعمق بجوهر هذه القضايا لأنه كما تعلمون روسيا تقول أنها بريئة وكل هذه التهم هي باطلة ولكن المقصود كان أن كل هذا له تأثير سلبي جدا على فرص بإيجاد الحل لقضايا الشرق الأوسط فأنا أتفق هون مع سيد بحوت أنه كل ما ينفجر تنفجر شيء قضية ما بين روسيا وبريطانيا ما بين روسيا وأمريكا فكل هذا له تداعيات سلبية جدا على ما يحدث في الشرق الأوسط فنحن بحاجة للتخفيف هذا التوتر وروسيا مستعدة لهذا الشيء وهون برأيي يزيد دور دول أوروبية وهي ليست لديها مصلحة بتعميق هذه الخلافات فمثلا فرنسا وألمانيا كلها الآن تحاول تتوسط حتى ما بين روسيا وأمريكا وروسيا ترحب بهذه الجهود فعودة لمتافرة لصورة الدب الروسي فنحن تعودنا على هذه الصورة ونحن صغار لأنه في قصص الأطفال وفي أفلام الكرتون الروسية الدب هو طيوب عنا هو مشرس و... <تصفيق> وهو يساعد الأطفال الضائعين في الغابة ف... وعلى فكرة على فكرة زرت برلين من فترة قصيرة ورأيت بأن هناك رموز للدب وين ما كان في برلين لأنه يرمز لبرلين فلا أعتقد أن ألمان لهم نظرة للدب مختلفة عن نظرة روسية ف... هنا ممكن نلاقي قاسما مشتركا لحظة لحظة رجاء معلش بعطيكم الدور بس رجاء يعني أرجو أرجو حفاظا على يعني مكانة لحظة خلي أعطوني الفرصة لا ترى رئيس عربي ما يتنازل فيعني إلا الشيخ أمين جميل خلينا نثري النقاش بدقيق توجيه اتهامات ويعني مهاترات رجاء يعني لنرقى لمستوى بيت المستقبل بنخرج ب يعني محصلة حقيقية مش إثبات إنه أنا غلطان ولا أنت غلطان عريب بعدك شكرا سيد الرئيس عندي أسئلة موجهة لإلينا ومسفيان تحديدا واختصر رجاء ولا يهمك يا سيدي السؤال الأول يعني أنا وافقك بنقطتين جوهريتين مخاوف إيران ومعك كل الحق في ذلك والنقطة الثانية الرود ماب اللي رسمتها في الأخير الثلاث اقتراحات اللي قدمتها وهي اقتراحات متكررة طرحت في مؤتمر قبل أيام أسابيع في بيروت للمركز الدراسات الاستراتيجية في الجيش اللبناني وطرحت في مؤتمر للمفارقة في نظم حزب الله حول الحوار العربي الإيراني ما لم ما لم تصدر عن طهران الآن مؤشرات بأنها مستعدة للذهاب إلى التعاون الإقليمي وليس لديها أجندة هيمنة وتفتيت في هذه المنطقة لن يكتب النجاح لكل هذه المبادرات ماذا يعني أن يخرج علينا ولاية في بغداد يوم الانتخابات العراقية ليقول لن نسمح للشيوعيين والليبراليين بحكم العراق بعد اليوم شو خصو شو علاقته وماذا يعني أن يقول المسؤول أننا نحكم أربع عواصم عربية؟ 
وماذا يعني انشاء كيانات موازيه هذا امر هذا امر كل هذا الحديث لو سمحت يا اخي كل هذا الحديث عن النوايا الطيبه يعني لا يكفي لوحده بده يكون مقرون باجراءات ايرانيه هذا اولا وثاني ثانيا يا سيدي يعني في كلمتك تحدثت عن ادوار معظم اللاعبين ما سمعناش شيء كثير عن الدور الايراني سوى انه دور دفاعي وقائي دور المظلوم الضحيه الى اخره وهذا يعني اسمح لي فيه يعني اسمح لي فيه هذا كلام يعني هذا الخطاب الرسمي الايراني الينا الشعر يقول كل شيء ولا يقول شيء أنا ما فهمت منك شيء بصراحة أقول لك يعني أنا عن الدور الروسي والمنطقة أنا لم أفهم منك شيئاً عن الدور الروسي وكسبا للوقت وبديش أدخل في كل الدور الروسي والمنطقة بدي تجاوبيني على سؤال واحد أو سؤالين ليه بس السؤال الأول بدنا نعرف شوية أكثر عن التفاهمات الروسية الإسرائيلية بوتين نتنياهو لأنه الاعتقاد الجازم عندنا في المنطقة أنه اللي ظاهر من هذه التفاهمات أقل بكثير من اللي غاطس وهذا ياخذنا الى الموقف الايراني الروسي في سوريا اين تتفقون واين تختلفون وهل رفعت روسيا الغطاء عن الوجود الايراني في سوريا بدلاله هذه الغارات الاسرائيليه المتكرره ضد اهداف ايرانيه دون ان تبلغ موسكو الطرف ذي الصله في هذا المجال حتى بمجرد ابلاغ وليس تشغيل الصواريخ المضاده للطائرات والصواريخ الاسرائيليه شكرا استاذ عيد دباخ تفضل. اي نعم شكرا. باختصار رجاء باختصار نعم. مستر موسويان يو هاد ادريس ذات ايران از ريدي تو دايلوج وذ ذا ريجنال عرب كونتريز اند ذا ريجنال كونتريز. از ايران از ريدي تو هاف ذات دايلوج وذ ذا يوروبيان فور ذا نن نيوكليير ديل ذا رول اوف ذا ايرانيين يوروبيان ار اسكينج دايلوج Do you agree that Arab regional uh, countries like Saudi Arabia, Gulf state, to be part of that dialogue, if it is agreed? Uh, Elena, uh, the Russian role in the region, do you treat, do, do, do Russia treat the Iranian role as, يعني دور الإيراني مكمل للدور الروسي؟ هل تعتبر الدور إيجابي روسيا الدور الإيراني مكمل؟ uh, الرئيس الان الحديث كله يعني مشكله الحوار اللي تتدخل الان كل شيء لانه طلعنا احنا من النقطه المفترضه اللي هي هل القوى الدوليه واللاعبين الاساسيين يساهموا بانحلال الاستاذ جوزيف ارجو ان توضح النقطه كم الى اي مدى اللاعبين الاساسيين روسيا الان مثلا دعت الى الفدراليه في سوريا هل هذا يعتبر تفكك الى سوريا؟ الولايات المتحدة دعمت الأكراد وخلتهم أنه يشعرون بأنهم فعلا قوة تستحق أن تكون لا يكون لها نوع من الفدرالية نوع من الحكم الذاتي نوع من إيران الآن هل دورها هو تفكك ولا دور جامع لأنه الكل يدعي بأنه يريد سوريا موحدة كم هو الدور اللاعبين الدوليين إذا نرجع للمحور من فضلك شكرا شكرا انصافا للمرأة في سيدة شكرا منى فيان شكرا على تعطيك انا ما بدي طبعا ادخل بتفاصيل لانه كل شيء قاله مسيو حسين ممكن نناقشه واضح القاع قديش مستفزه بس بدي اسال عن نقطه الشرعيه ما معنى شرعيه بالع... بالدوله ما معنى دوله الى حدود محترمه او لا نحن بنعرف ان الدول هلا الشعب هو سيد نفسه وقت اللي بيكون في دولة عندها انتخابات معناه نحن عم ناخد رأي الشعب بمين بده يحكم فأنا بدي أسأل أي شرعية عم نحكي عنها وقت اللي في عندنا 12 مليون سوري مهجرين وأي حكومة بأي قانون دولة بالعالم قاعدة تقصف شعبها وإجت دولة من برا شو ما كانت الحجة اللي أخذتها إن شاء الله تكون يعني مع العدالة المطلقة بالعالم اجت دولة من برا، نحن بلبنان من عدة محتلة لسوريا، معظم الناس طبعا في ناس معكم 100% بالمية. بس انه شو هالشرعية هاي من وين من وين بجيبها الواحد؟ وانا هون بدي اسال يعني اذا كان الشاه سنة 79 ما ترك ايران 
ورد على الثورة بالدم وإجت الدولة ساعدته شو كنتوا بتعملوا كان بيكون شرعي لو لو الشاه إيران بقوة أمريكا مثلا أو بقوة أي دولة تانية فأنا بدي إجابة على هالسؤال وعلى أنه إغفالكم أنه خلال سبعة أشهر سنة تقريبا كانت ثورة وبتعدوها أنها مش ثورة وأنه يعني وهلأ عند أي منطقة قبل ما يهجرهم كلهم لسوريا كان يصير في سلم كانوا يرجعوا ينزلوا على الشارع بدهم تغيير النظام أنا مش فهماني هاي الشرعية وهذا الطبق وصلت النقطة معلش بس حتى بعطي آخر تفضل أيوة. يعني. أنا نعم فادي الأحمر لا لي وراك لي وراك معلش لأنه بيأ... بيأكلني سيدة مسموع؟ اتفضل يا عم مين هو معنا؟ وين؟ اوكي سؤالي بالمختصر بل هي دقيقة نص دقيقة سيدة إلينا قالت أن تدخلت روسيا ل محاربة الإرهاب بينما السيد لافروف قال لقد تدخلنا بأبريل 2015 وهي عرفت بعصف بسخوي لمساندة النظام وقال لولانا لكان سقط النظام بعد ثلاث أسابيع رغم الدعم الإيراني أما عن الدب الروسي الذي تكلمت عنه وهو يوزع الحمائم ويعرف بالروسية بروسية ميديا بعرف قلت مزبوط أنه وزع هذا الدب الحمائم هي عبارة عن قصف للشعب السوري وتدمير للشعب السوري أوكي؟ السيد موسيان قلت لنا ان ايران تحترم سيادات الدول وان وتهاجمكم امريكا وهي وقفت معكم بجنرال قاسم سليماني مع الضباط الامريكان عم بيحاربوا الارهاب بالعراق وقلتم عن اسرائيل انها عدوه والمعروف انكم ساعدتكم اسرائيل بايران جيت وضقت عمله اخيرا بمناسبه السفاره الامريكيه بايرا باسرائيل موجود عليها الاسد الايراني مع المنار الاسرائيلي اللي بده يتفضل نعم فادي احمد تفضل مش حارجع للموضوع لن نعود الى الى مقطيل عن موضوع ايران الملاحظه للاستاذ مصفيان موضوع ايران والدول العربيه وكيف يمكن ان شاء الله رجعنا نقطة واحدة بموضوع خلوا المتحدث يتكلم رجاء خلينا نحترم يعني قدسية بيت المستقبل فضل. أود أن أثير فقط نقطة أساسية بما يخص إيران وهو سؤال إلى أستاذ مصابيان إيران نظامها مختلف عن يعني نظام نظام الثورة الذي هو أختصره بكلمة ازدواجية ازدواجية في السياسة سلطتين سياسيتين ازدواجية في العسكر سلطتين عسكريتين إلى ما هنالك ومحاولتها تصدير هذا النظام في إلى دول بدأ في لبنان اليوم في العراق في سوريا أعتقد تحاول أن تقول يعني ميليشيا سلطة إلى جانب الدولة هذه لا لا تساعد يعني هذه تفكك الدول وتفكك أمن الدول لا تساعد في قيام الدولة ما بعرف إذا بتوافق من الرأي سؤال للسيدة إلينا سو إلينا سو إلينا يعني أستاذ بحوث حكي عن الأوبورتونيتي أوف أوف لروسيا بسوريا ما كانت أوبورتونيتي كمان وقت اللي روسيا دخلت وحكيت مع المعارضة وروسيا لديها صداقة مع الشعب السوري صداقة تاريخية فقدتها اليوم وقت اللي لعبت كمان لعبة ازدواجية مع المعارضة السورية يعني بعطي بطل بس فقط جيش الإسلام اللي راح ناقش حاور بالأسيتانا وزار موسكو ولكن من بعد من من شهرين دمرته بالغوطة الشرقية ألم تكن فرصة أيضا لروسيا كي تكون صديقة ليس فقط للنظام ولكن للشعب السوري شكرا جزيلا وسط الفكرة أستاذ حسن آخر سؤال بعدين أنا وقفنا يعني عندنا عشر دقائق وبعدين أي نقاش ممكن مع المتحدثين خارج القرار شكرا جزيلا تعليق سريع والسؤال أشوف يتعلق بمسألة حتمية المواجهة المقبلة في المنطقة تحدث جوزيف وكأن الصراع الإسرائيلي الإيراني سوف يؤدي إلى انفجار لابد منه السؤال لا لا ليس بالإمكان اعتبار بأن ما يجري اليوم في سوريا هو في حقيقة الأمر هذا الانفجار بديل عن هذا الانفجار بشكل تنفيذ متسارع أي أن إسرائيل قد أقدمت على غارات دمرت ما يقارب النصف من البنية التحتية الإيرانية في في سوريا مع أعطاء إيران 
إمكانية إنكار ذلك والقول بأننا لم نتعرض للأذى أي بعبارة أخرى إسرائيل تسعى إلى تحقيق المرجو بالنسبة لها وهو تقليص الوجود الإيراني ولكن دون الدخول في مواجهة لأنها تعتبر بأن إيران هي على الحدود الإسرائيلية فيما أن إسرائيل ليست على الحدود الإيرانية وأية مواجهة بهذا الشكل مؤذية للجانبين مواجهة علنية كبيرة مؤذية للجانبين إيران قد حققت جزء من انتصار في سوريا طبعا المنتصرة في سوريا هي روسيا ولكن جزء من الانتصار من نصيب إيران وبالتالي أي معركة هي تفريط بهذا الانتصار ومن جانب إسرائيل إذا تمكنت من, من الردع من خلال تقليص البنية التحتية الإيرانية فلا ضرورة للمواجهة بعبارة أخرى بطبيعة الأحوال في حال حصلت المواجهة لبنان وسوريا هم هما من يدفعان الثمن ولكن التوجه الحالي هو أنه بالتمكين تنفيس هذه المواجهة من خلال هذه الحرب السرية المدمرة للبنية التحتية الإيرانية إنما مع إمكانية الإنكار تعليم حقيقة يعني عندنا خمس دقائق بعطي كل متحدث ثلاث دقائق ونختم الجلسة بهذا الفضل. But most of the questions is for me three minutes. About variety, I think you have not read the massive criticism on the Iranian side. Every political faction in Iran. I criticized Velayati himself in Iran. Perhaps you heard what Velayati said, but you didn't hear how massive criticism from the Iranian different political factions against his statement. About legitimacy, and uh, I, I think you are right, legitimacy is one issue, legality also is one issue. We have to address legality and legitimacy. What I said, I said the presence of foreign non-Syrian nation citizens in Syria, tens of thousands from 80 to 100 countries were illegitimate and illegal. I have nothing against the will of Syrian nation. I have written many op-eds criticizing President Assad, specifically the first the, the peaceful demonstration, which he reacted in violent. But in general, if you want to know what is the end state of Iranian strategy, policy, solution for different crises in this region, is first the rule or the will of majority everywhere. It doesn't matter this is, is Syria or Bahrain or Yemen. It doesn't matter. Second, power sharing. Somewhere Sunni is in majority, somewhere Shia is in majority. Third is free election by the people even if the country is in too many problems like Syria, this election should be supervised by United Nations, not the government. If you want to know whether this is true or not, this is a real strategy Iranians they have or not, I remind you of two crises in the region. One was Afghanistan, 2001. Iran proposed Karzai, a Sunni Pashtun, to be the leader because over there Sunni Pashtuns are majority. Iran pushed Tajik Sunni to be the second. Everywhere. Everywhere. I'm not talking, I am saying everywhere. In Yemen, if Sunni is majority, that's fine. I'm talking, I'm, I'm talking about the principles. I'm talking about principles, about Yemen, Bahrain, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, everywhere. I'm talking about principles. Iran and the U.S., they were major powers, regional and international powers. They agreed in Afghanistan 2001. Based on the rule of majority, the power sharing, Shia, Tajik II, and free election. They agreed the same principles in Iraq. In Iraq, Shia is majority. The US and Iran, they agreed. 
a president court, a court is a president, a Sunni is minority, the speaker of parliament is Sunni. This is the two practical steps and evidence and crisis which the principles already have been implemented and Iran has supported. If there is a regional international willing, if there is any problem with these three principles, the rule or the will of majority, power sharing, free election, non-foreign country. In Egypt, we didn't have terrorists to go to Egypt tens of thousands. In Bahrain, we didn't have tens of thousands of foreign terrorists to go to Bahrain. In Iran revolution, we didn't have uh, tens of thousands of foreign citizens to come to Iran. Revolution is perfect, is legitimate, is the vote of people. But I'm talking about the intervention of, 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 of the U.S. by multiple wars in the region. And about export of revolution, to be very frank, it is a big concern of all Arab countries. We have to recognize. Iranians, they have to recognize. At the same time, you should also recognize Iranians, they have exactly the same concern about Wahhabism and Sunni countries in Iran. What I proposed, I suggested immediately the eight countries in the region, the foreign minister, they sit together and put all concerns every country has on the table. Too late. GCC, they have legitimate concerns, why not? Iranians, they have. Iraqis, they have. I mean, as a solution, I suggested the, 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 the new approach. Thank you very much. In fact, my... my uh, my intuition that I was sandwiched between the two proved to be right because I was completely uh, obliterated in the debate, which is good. I could I could uh, hear you all uh, very quickly. I was asked, uh, I mean, two or three questions that I'll try to wrap up um, in the same frame. Uh, first of all, the, the, the contours of a political solution in Syria, the question of federalization, decentralization, etc. Okay, I think yesterday. Uh, Mota Sem Sufi said something which uh, I think is right. I mean, the contours of a definitive political solution or solution to Syria today is non-existent. Uh, there are frameworks, there are texts that are on the table, but all of them are today uh, more or less fictional. The, uh, the framework that is agreed upon internationally, the only one today, until today is the Geneva 2 platform. It is completely now a kind of theoretical uh, reference. The real platform or the real dynamics is the couple Astana Sochi, which is a purely Russian kidnapped uh, process that in fact doesn't aim to in fact really go towards a political solution besides uh, rendering uh, more or less definitive or, or rendering more or less stable the statu quo on the ground that exists today. And then you have, um, let's say, parallel tracks, like, for example, the small group on Syria that is working on the constitution under the auspices of Stefan de Mistura, which in fact somewhere intersects with the Geneva II and somewhere uh, or sometimes uh, take a distance from that. So there's nothing so far on the table regarding the definitive solution. And I don't think that the situation is ripe so far on the ground in order to have such a solution. I agree with uh, uh, Dr. Oreb yesterday who said that probably the, the most probable uh, scenario for Syria is that this situation with margin of 10, 15 percent will stay as is for the coming, for the coming years. It leads me to second, to the point two, which is also uh, asked for me and I think was uh, in a way a kind of hovering issue uh, on this panel. The Russian-Iranian uh, Russian relation, it's endless, we could talk for hours about that. Let me put it very briefly. If, I mean, as long as the war slash tension slash friction in Syria and the region and on the international level exist, Russia and Iran will stick together. They could quarrel on small details. One of them could eliminate two officers from here because most of the assassination that you hear about in Syria are Russian-Iranian, let's say, settlement of accounts. But this doesn't change the macro picture. The regime is still owned by the two. They will quarrel at some point on who has the majority of shares in this venture, but we're not there yet. 
Now, if the tension releases, and this is what I said, and this was one of the blunders of the American administration, that by, in fact, pushing again Iran on that, I mean, to that extent in the corner, they have, in, sense, in fact, strengthened bonds between Russia and Iran that were starting to uh, loosen. And they will strengthen bonds between Iran and probably China and etc. So when one day we will reach a stable solution in Syria, yes, definitely there will be a friction between the shareholders of who owns, in fact, the majority of the Syrian corporation. Assad is today only, a, I mean, an executive director that is owned by a board that, I mean, he's, he doesn't have a decision in that board. Uh, which leads me to the third point uh, and your point, Hassan. I fully agree with you. I mean, today the war is on in proxy, is by proxy over Syria between Iran and, and Russia, uh, between Iran and Israel. However, this is today. You mentioned two things. What could change that? First of all, if the Israeli military establishment, which, I mean, we know a little bit about, is satisfied with the idea of coexisting with what he calls, what it calls, a monster that is growing like a cancer cell, in a deterrence way, like a mutual assured destruction, yes, Syria will remain the theater of proxy limited confined wars with understandings through the postal box that is Russia today. But I don't see things stable at that point for many reasons. First of all, because Iran will grip over Syria and won't accept the gradual destruction of its assets in Syria. What will it do? I don't know, but I know and we know and you know that Iran usually plays the long haul and asymmetric wars. They never confront frontally. They will never confront Israel frontally in Syria unless they are obliged. So they will sink. Israel in Syria in a way or another, and Lebanon is an example between 18, 1982 and 2006. And so we will have, and the second thing which I concluded on, which is for me a question mark, I don't have an answer, is the new given in this equation, which is the uh, withdrawal, I mean the end of the GCPOA. If really there is an American uh, serious design of regime change in Iran, that is accepted and desired in Israel, and you know that it is desired in Israel. I mean, the Israelis would like to see the regime changing in Iran. Plus a kind of gulfy fantasy about that, I think that this could explode the confined, let's say, proxy war in the south of Syria and widen it. We are not there yet, I agree with you, but what I see is that the trend is leading us uh, towards that. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, we first started with the lady and ended with the ladies. شكرا آه الاسئله كثيره فاتمنى السيد عبيد لا تكون معي قاسي مثل ما كان السيد رنتاوي فلانه انا وفرت خمس دقائق في البدايه ف شكرا آه لقد تالمت صحيحا من وراء تعليقك ولكنني امل لحتى الان انه اذا كان من كان يريد ان يفهم قد فهم بس أدهشتني شخصيا لأنني كنت أعتقد أنك من أكثر الناس القادرين على التوصل من الظاهر إلى الباطن ولكن شكرا على أقل على ذكر مركز الدراسات التابع للجيش أيضا لأنه هي فرصة أن نشكرهم على جهودهم بحضور جنرال أبيك فراج مثل ما نشكر مزون دي فيتور بالنسبة ل بالنسبة لإسرائيل ومعادلات وروسيا في في الشرق الأوسط فروسيا ما زالت بهذه المعادلات التي بنتها وبنتها بنتها بصعوبة لأنه من الصعب على بلد أن تحافظ على علاقاته المتوازنة مع جميع اللاعبين بالمنطقة. يمكن كان من السهل مثل ما أن تتصرف أمريكا أنه لديهم أعداء ولديهم حلفاء لا بعتقد أن هناك مبالغات كثيرة في الصحف الآن في الصحف العربية خاصة أنه كأنه روسيا بدأت تميل لأحد المعسكرات أبدا روسيا ما زالت بهذه الموازنات فبالنسبة لإسرائيل فقط أريد أن أذكركم بما تقول روسيا حول ضرورة تقوية الإمكانيات الدفاعية السورية هذا ما أزعج إسرائيل كثيرا في قضية فلسطين وموضوع القدس روسيا مختلفة تماما مع أمريكا ومع إسرائيل 
وانتم تعلمون تماما ايضا ان موقف روسيا من حركات متعدده في الشرق الاوسط هو موقف مختلف روسيا لديها اتصالات بحركه حماس روسيا لديها اتصالات بحركه حزب الله وهذا ايضا خلافا مع امريكان الذين يعتبرون هذه الحركات ارهابيه موقف روسيا هو مختلف ف سيد علي الدباغ سؤالك كان حول هل تكون ايران وسياستها بشكل تتم لسياسه روسيا لا روسيا ليست لديها غطرسه بهذا الشكل ابدا روسيا لم تكن ابدا وين ما كان بهذا الشكل نحن ننظر الى شركائنا بشكل متساوي والتعاون مثلا ما بين روسيا وتركيا وايران هو تعاون بشكل مثلث مثلث اطرافها متساويه ف فهذا التعاون بوجهه راي روسيا عليه ان يستمر وبالعكس تماما روسيا لا تريد ان تصطاد في مي العاكره في الشرق الاوسط بالعكس روسيا تريد ان يكون هناك استقرارا وما قاله في البدايه السيد موسيفيان حول ضروره انشاء منظمه الامن والتعاون في المنطقه بمثابة منظمة الأمن والتعاون في أوروبا على سبيل المثال فهذا ما تقترحه كانت روسيا حتى قبل أحداث 2011 روسيا دائما كانت تقترح هذا الشيء المشكلة أن شركائنا شركائنا الغربيين لحتى الآن لم يستوعبوا ضرورة هذه المبادرات إن شاء الله حنتوصل ل تحقيقها فيما بعد ولكنني اتفق مع زملائي مع جوزيف ومع حسين انه صوره تبدو متشائمه لانه هذا التعاون لحتى الان هو سابق لاوانه الاخ الكريم الذي تكلم عن واستشهد لكلام لافروف بعتقد ان هذا الاستشهاد هو غير دقيق كان لانه سيد لافروف لم يكن لم يقل انه هدف روسيا كان تغيير موازنات القوى وقال أن هدف روسيا كان مكافحة الإرهاب ولكن بالنتيجة موازين القوى قد تغيرت في سوريا وهذا ما تكلمت أنا عنه في هذه الكلمة أنا أعرف سيد لابروف شخصيا ودائما أقرأ ما يقوله فأنا حافظة تماما ما قاله بتلك المناسبة في المؤتمر الصحفي لا مو أنا كتبت سيد فادي بالنسبة للمعارضة أنا كنت يمكن من أول الناس مستشرقين في روسيا اللي بدأوا أن يلتقون بممثلي المعارضة في روسيا ونعرفهم كلهم ولحتى الآن هم يأتون وبعتقد أنهم سيأتون إلى موسكو وإلى سوتشي وإلى أستنا لأن وزن روسيا ودورها أصبح واضحا المشكلة فقط بأنه بعض الأحيان واحد حتى رغم أنه ذاكرتي يمكن مو كتير ضعيفة ولكن بعض الأحيان واحد ينسى أسماء الزعماء أنه بيجوا بعدين بيجي واحد تاني وثالث لأول صدقت كلامهم أنه هذا نوع من الديمقراطية أنه ينتخبون كل مرة واحد جديد ولكن اكتشفنا بعدين أن المعارضة دخلت في صراعاتها الداخلية كل مرة يتغير الزعيم حتى ما بتعرف مع مين أم تتعامل فهناك أيضا مشكلة داخلية في صفوف المعارضة بحاجة برأي لحلها وهذا ممكن أن يساعد على إيجاد الحل للأزمة في سوريا وشكرا جزيلا سباسيبا شكرا للأستاذ حسين جوزيف لينا الجلسة كانت يعني شوي ساخنة وهذا الشيء طبيعي المنطقة العربية ساخنة نشكر المتحدثين ونقبل باب النقاش بشكرا جزيلا For the panelists of yesterday and today, we will have a group picture outside. So please stay. We'll go all together for the group picture.